the pod is inspired about what we're seeing in the Premier League and the main topic that we're going for is clubs in the Premier League and projects. I think the best of a bad bunch scenario is a perfect way to put it. But with them levels that have been that way for the last few years, do I think I could see Arsenal doing that again next season? I'm not so sure. Why do United don't have a price limit? They don't, they don't have a price limit. Like, we can, we're getting new owners. We can sign anybody. Well, I thought you had a price limit the other week. Oh, with Vegost. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Will Klopp see out this rebuild? Yes. And how long will that take? Within three years. We did say today, someone asked him like, have you got enough time to do this? He said, I've got energy for another 10 years. So welcome back to the Tactic Talk podcast. I'm joined with Luke and Jack. And at the time of recording, we've just watched uh, Arsenal beat Manchester United 3-2 at the Emirates, which wasn't the greatest watch for us United fans. I'm sure Luke's lapping it up there. But then again, he is a Liverpool fan, so yeah. not much, there's not much to shout about for you. Um, but because of that, um, the pod is inspired about what we're seeing in the Premier League. And the main topic that we're going for is clubs in the Premier League and projects. So a team like Arsenal, for example, um, they're seeing the fruits of the patience that they've had in the project with Arteta and they've tactically put together something like a structure for the recruitment to add players to. Uh, we've got Liverpool who are towards the end of their project, their first sort of wave of their projects under Klopp. Uh, they saw the fruits of their, their patience with Klopp. Klopp built something that went on to win Champions Leagues. Well, Champions League, Premier, Premier League. League. Everything um, they contested for. And now they're probably a team at the end of their life cycle. And now Klopp's trying to extend that life cycle, trying to extend what he's got at Klopp to transition them into a new project almost. And then you've got Pep and City who seamlessly transition from project to project, adding players in. It almost seems like they're on a massive project that is like amazingly managed and then mm-hmm. Manchester United with Eric Ten Hag. Fir- first time a project's really kicked off for Manchester United. So that's the main talking point that we're going for today. The life cycle <laughs> of a Premier League project. And we're going to be talking about the big teams and seeing where they're at in their projects. Um, so the first thing I want to say is we have watched uh, Arsenal versus Manchester United. Uh, Jack, thoughts on the game? Thoughts from a Manchester United well, fan? Well, to be honest with you... I don't really want to talk about it because <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why I'm here. Talk <laughs> podcast. I don't want to talk. I don't want to fucking talk. <laughs> um, no, I think the biggest thing was the absence of Casemiro today. Yeah, because Arsenal's midfield ran as ragged. It looked like they were just they were everywhere. The patterns of play, they stretched us, they made us run. Ericsson looked knackered after about 60 minutes. I agree with that. Um, McTominay didn't really know what he was doing. He didn't really have any purpose yeah. in that midfield. He, he never dropped deep. Um, when we had the ball with De Gea or Lissandro, he sort of yeah. up near Veghorst. Um That was weird. And then for the most part, during the defending, um, lost certain players. So... Yeah, the absence of Casemiro, who can do Ericsson's job and he can do McTominay's job where he would play those passes and also cover ground is a massive loss. He's basically two players in one. Luke, I know you used the phrase for Fabinho of, as like the lighthouse yeah, yeah. in midfield where every player sort of... Everything puts, goes through him. Goes through him and everyone sort of positions mm-hmm. themselves based off the lighthouse mm-hmm. that you've said Fabinho has been for Liverpool mm-hmm. in the last few years. Um, how important do you think that is um, for the teams at the top? You know, you've seen Party and Casemiro. How important do you think that is? I think is? It's, it's exceptional, especially for a game management perspective. I think without that individual being there, it's very easy to get loose ends in a team, and especially in midfield. Uh, I think obviously we've seen that with Liverpool and stuff like that, but I thought, especially with United today, like I said, you mentioned there, you can do Ericsson's job and you can do um, McTominay's job. In what sorry, that is tickled. Yeah. <laughs> but you can do two you can do two in one. Yeah. Um which just gives the freedom to when you have that midfield with Casemiro in there, you have Ericsson and Bruno, 
you can play a long term without having to worry about what's going backwards. Yeah. He gives you so much security. And today you really saw that, I think. And it's important for every team. I think if you look at the last Premier League winning teams, I mean, City 5, Liverpool 1. Yeah. Rodri's been there. Fernandinho's been there. Fabinho's been there. I feel like you need to have that six, that solid player who is that lighthouse. Even if you go backwards, you're thinking of Kante for Leicester. Yeah. Matic for Chelsea. Chelsea. Kante also for Chelsea. Mm -hmm. So... That, that position is... It's imperative yeah, it's to be imperative. successful. And I think if you look at United, especially in that win streak you had recently, Casemiro was probably your best player. He was unbelievable. He yeah. didn't drop between an 8 out of 10 in every single game. And he's been absolutely amazing for you. And you really saw the absence of him today, especially when Arsenal had Xhaka and Partey doing their jobs. Yeah. So that sort of takes us into the first question related to a project. Um, Arsenal won. Arsenal looked like they're stampeding towards the title mm. almost we don't want to get too giddy uh, for an Arsenal fan but um, say we're sort of talking as if we're ending the season and Arsenal have won mm. right um, if if this Arsenal team does go on to win the Premier League would you say they're more so like a, a Leicester type win in the Premier League like Leicester in 2015 or do you think that this team is projecting like how Klopp's Liverpool were projecting after the Kiev season, for example, where everyone sort of knew the players were in place for them to improve? Or do you think this is just mm -hmm. a case of Arsenal capitalising on the best of a bad bunch scenario? I think the best of a bad bunch scenario is a perfect way to put it, because I think if you look at, say, the seasons that Liverpool and City have put up in their title races, it's been 92 plus points. Um, I mean, obviously, Arsenal are putting up, what have they got now, 50? 50. 50, 50 points with 18. So there's 54 games to points to play for, I'm pretty sure, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so they can still get around that margin, but will they have somebody who will get that close? And obviously, City will, but if, if I don't know if Arsenal will get to like the 92 plus. I do see them dropping points hit in here and there. But with them levels that have been that way for the last few years, do I think I could see Arsenal doing that again next season? I'm not so sure. So I'd say it is quite, I'd say personally for me, on the Leicester to Liverpool scale, if you will, I'd say they're much more towards Liverpool than they are Leicester. So if you were to put a percentage on it, say Liverpool are 100%, the mm. Klopp's Liverpool in, like when they were projecting for the Kiev season, yeah. uh, 100%, and Leicester's uh, 2015 fluke season where they won it is 0%. Where would you put Arsenal on that scale? I'd put them 65 to 70%. Um, because I, th I think they're much closer to us than they are anywhere near close to Leicester because Leicester was a freak season. It's something that will probably never happen again in the Premier League. Of course, yeah. But um, this Arsenal, they're a proper team, proper side, who have got a very big future. But it's whether they have that continuity to go and do it again and again and again. Jack, same mm -hmm. question. Where would you put them on this the scale that we've just created? Out well, I want, to, I want to disagree to keep it interesting, but I would agree with 70%. Mm -hmm. Because so then, yeah. it feels like with Arsenal... You've you've sort of you've got the whole you've got loads of different jigsaw pieces and no one could really see the picture. But then this season, you can suddenly see it. It's just all come together, like all the individual players that aren't necessarily highly rated, like world class players, um, like Martin Odegaard. His heating is the highest he's ever reached at this point. Yeah, Saka today looked the best he's been. Maybe maybe World Cup was another another yeah. peak for him. So in this system it looks like these players are reaching their peak because they're getting the benefits out of this particular system. With Leicester, it was more like you had you had certain tools. You had Mares, you had Vardy, who they knew were their, their, their threats. And they played that whole Arsenal team looks to me to be close to the finished article. Right. So I would agree it's more closer to, mm -hmm. to that Liverpool. So if we're both agreeing um, that... They're projecting like a Klopp's Liverpool where they can become like, you know, one of the teams that challenge consistently for the next few years. Again, I'm aware we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. They've not even won the league. Mm -hmm. But say they get to a point like whatever happens this season, they've challenged and they've put a good name for themselves. Mm -hmm. And Arsenal fans will all say we trust in the process. What is the next stage of this process? Obviously, with Klopp in the Kiev season, he bought Van Dijk in January and it was Alisson and Fabinho came in. Mm -hmm. And at the time, these names were the ones that were the, the last pieces of the jigsaw, if, you, if you'd like. Um, you'd look at this Arsenal team now and you'd say, there's not really gaps in their team. 
like the same way there was with like a Lovren in the Kiev season or like a, a goalkeeper in Karius. But where is the next step? Like what is the next, maybe is it players? Is it is it a structure? Is it a tweak? What is the next step for them to maintain the level that they're at over the next few years? I think there are improvements to be made. Where are they? They're not obvious though. They're not obvious. Mm -hmm. They're not, like you said, Karius making mistakes in the Champions League final. That's a testament to Arteta. Then, uh, that's yeah. a testament to the system he's built yeah. and how he's managed to pick maybe lesser players, um, but essentially make them look like the finished article. Maybe they aren't. Maybe this behind closed doors, they're not really seeing the full picture but and they're glossing over certain cracks yeah. that will appear later on down the season when it gets into that crunch time. Mm -hmm. But so far, I mean, there's been talk about Arsenal's depth. The bench today didn't look great. I'm picking at straws. Like, honestly, this system looks good. No, I, I do think with a system like Arsenal's, though, um, when you have, like, influential players, say, and Ketty's done brilliantly at filling in for Jesus, by the way. I think that really is highlighting. I was one of the ones who was very sceptic about mm -hmm. would he be able to do that role. He's done fantastic. Um, I do think, though, in some spaces where they've got, say, right back is a bit of an issue for me. I know Ben White's been brilliant, but do how long... Do you want that? No, you could say like Kyle Walker, obviously, he's just an athlete, style defender for City and always was. But do you want a centre-back at right-back for the remainder of your teams? I don't know. Right. I think they would look at another player there, but I think the depth is a big issue for me when it comes to going forward because they have so many specialist-type players like Erdegaard, Xhaka, Saka. They got didn't mean that. <laughs> but they have, they have like loads of specialist-type players. If anything happens to them... Yeah. There's, yeah. there's nobody to fill up. Like Erdogan, for example, absolutely runs the show for them. He's if he's injured, yeah. he replaces him. Exactly. Um, so moving on from that, um, we're saying that for Arsenal to create this sort of long-lasting dynasty, they might need a few more players. Like Again, we're looking further ahead in the future. One team that definitely might need a few more players is um, Eric Ten Hag's Man United. They're a lot earlier on in the uh, project than an Arteta, a Klopp, uh, a Pep Guardiola. Mm -hmm. They're very much at the foundations and Pep uh, and uh, Ten Hag has done an amazing job at setting the foundations. Um, he's got the skeleton in place. Uh, Jack as a United fan. Obviously, I'm a United fan as well. What is, like, where do you put meat to bone on this skeleton? Like, where, where's the next stage to We need, add a, we need a striker. A striker. And I'm look at Veghorst is, he was at Besiktas. He's got Premier League experience. He's a good signing, but it's only temporary. Yeah. We need someone who we can build off and really be our striker for the next five years. Um, Casemiro's filled in nicely. I'm not too worried about holding midfield position yet. Obviously he's getting on a bit, but that's fine. Um, that defence looks okay when Dallow was back. Yeah, I would like to see a ball playing goalkeeper. Yeah, someone who's good with their feet um, instead of David de Gea. Because today, especially Lissandro was taking those short goal kicks for him. It doesn't really make much sense when he, he's passing it out to Wan Bissaka, not really assessing the full situation in front of him, putting his team under pressure. So I feel like that is something we need to work on. I didn't really understand that today. Personally, I know it did work initially, obviously like Lissandro passing it to De Gea, passing it to whoever it may be next. But I felt like in certain situations in the game, I, I thought that Arsenal, when they started to get more compact and start to box you in more and really control where you were on the pitch, I thought then there was, an, there was a situation where when Lissandro to De Gea to Lissandro to Varane, Varane couldn't get to Lissandro, had to go back to De Gea and Arsenal just kept coming up and coming up and then you eventually lost the ball. And I felt that... I just didn't understand that personally. Is that because they're scared of De Gea on the ball making the first initial pass? Mm -hmm. Or I, I don't know. I didn't understand that. I, I think it works initially, but Arsenal, when Arsenal got used to it and found it out, it was kind of a bit like, nothing's coming to this now. What I'd say to basically both your points there is um, there's a lack of, like, once you get past the first team, the, the players left aren't progressive enough um, for Ten Hag. And what I mean by that is a progressive action is a player that moves the ball upfield. Um, you can do that either from a dribble or from a pass. Mm -hmm. That's the main ways. The best players can do both. Mm -hmm. um, but United, in midfield, for example, we bought a progressive passer specialist in Ericsson. He's a passing progressive. Mm -hmm. um, someone who's more a specialist in terms of dribbling, 
would be like a like a Matthias Nunes for mm-hmm. Wolves, mm-hmm. who's who might be going to Liverpool. That's a progressive dribbler specialist. Um, what I'd say sort of that wraps up both your points there is once you get past this first eleven um, and you get players like Wan Bissaka, McTominay, these players are nowhere near progressive enough for Ten Hag's style of play. Mm-hmm. And I feel like ball progression, whether it's off a dribble, off um, a pass, when you have players like Wan Bissaka and McTominay who get the ball and the opposition know that they're not capable of doing it, I feel like that's when the 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 tower starts to fall. Everyone sort of susses us out, and we become a bit you predictable. Saw that today, and we definitely saw that today. Yeah, McTominay was nowhere near that little box playing you were doing. Yeah, like you had said before, you said what it was more near to Rashford than he probably was the ball. And he was your deepest player in that game. And it's like, if he's not coming to get the ball, it's obviously because the manager doesn't trust him. Exactly. Um, and that's a problem. And that's where, obviously, like going forward, players lie because he needs players he can trust. And there's a lot of chopping and changing. He's done a lot with some players. Like for example, he obviously doesn't trust Jaden Sancho in the current shape that he's in. So he's been away from the squad a bit. Obviously, he's come back now towards the team. But there is some players he does need. I think, again, I think without Casemiro, it shows that your midfield is quite thin. And I think Fred might be leaving at the end of the year, right? Potentially. Potentially. So I do think you're bringing a few players there. I think I agree with you and your striker. Personally, you've got two te- names touted at the moment, haven't you, and Kane and Osman. So let's jump onto the names quick. So I want to ask you, Luke, as an objective Liverpool fan looking in, mm-hmm. if I were to say to you, we're getting three players next summer, one's the long-term striker, yeah. and two of them are progressive players, whether they're a progressive passer in right back, a progressive dribbler in right back, a progressive pass in midfield or a dribbler or like both. Mm-hmm. Who are these two progressive players that will elevate United to the next level and who's their long-term striker as well? Well, I think I'm, in my head, I, per, in my opinion, I know who I think you should get as a long-term striker. One who I'd hate if you got because I think he's got a very high ceiling, Victor Osimhen. I think he's phenomenal and he's an amazing player and he'd be deadly for you. Um, so that's who I think you should get long-term. For the rest of your team, I'm not too sure in midfield. One name I think I could, I could, I could tout now that I think obviously I could be going off the back of a good World Cup, but I do, I do think he won't be at this club much longer, and I think it could be a player you could look at is Alexis McAllister. I think he's one I think you, I could see playing for you. Progressive midfielder, yeah, exactly. Um, he's so got a bit of both about him as well. He can do, he can do pretty much anything in midfield. What I'd say about the ones that have a bit of both, they tend to be the ones that are more pricey, like yeah. Bellingham, Enzo mm-hmm. Fernandez, even Caicedo to an extent. Mm-hmm. Because they can do both, they're more expensive. Um, just wanted to add that in. So McAllister, Osimhen, and just one more player where, wherever you'd like. I can't really think of one that I think is like straight in there, but I think I think a goalkeeper, Jack mentioned it before. I know you've asked me to go for another progressive passer and stuff like that, but a goalkeeper, I'm struggling to think who I, who I would say, but like the ones I'm leaning towards that you could see playing for United is like Unai Sack, Simon or something like that, yeah. who's great with the feet. And that's he's not the best shot stop in the world, but he's great with his feet, and that's why he plays for Spain. Yeah. So if you're looking for that type of goalkeeper, I mean, you look at City. I mean, Edison is a good shot stopper, but he's not probably top three in the world at doing so. But his most important component is with his feet, and the way you've defended right now is shot stopping isn't really the key component. It's how you play out from the back. Yeah. I think you could add to that. So maybe him. So uh, just a little thing before I ask for your three players: uh, Osman, um, nineteen games. Um, this season, 14 goals, four assists. Obviously, that doesn't tell us what the player he Scored is. Scored again against Torino, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, uh, but he's definitely, you know, a high-profile mm-hmm. striker. Jack, same question. Who are your two progressive players and a striker for really... I'll, I'll go for the striker there. first. and Go for it. I don't necessarily believe he's the perfect fit, but we've talked about Harry Kane. So I want to actually, I want to mention Harry Kane. I feel like the way... The way he plays, the way he drops in, that link up with Son, if he could replicate that with Rashford, I would love to see it at United. Yeah. However, I just have a feeling that as soon as he comes to United, decline. It's it's downhill. And he's at that age where you are taking a little bit of a gamble. So maybe Osman's is is he he's not really the safer shout because he's not I will play devil's advocate to that. Uh, Harry Kane, I think he's 30 now. Mm. Um, you want a long he, term. But yeah. would you say that Harry Kane's ever a striker that's relied on his physicality, his athlete, athleticism? No, that's true. That's and true. say if it is a four-year contract, that's four years of 
Harry Kane, an immaculate professional mm-hmm. who looks after himself for sure. And he's hungry to win trophies. He's not won one yet. Yeah, he's... he's <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, like, you know, I, I think Harry Kane is a good shout there. Uh, Jack, your other two signings alongside that? I mean, is this a dream scenario? A, dr- a, a dream... A dream sort of with a bit of realism involved. Well, it's Man United we're talking about. Like, realistically, we could... We could break the bank and sell and sign anybody. Yeah. We could sign anybody. <laughs> I know what name is coming there. Yeah, you know, I don't, go on, who is it? Jim Bellingham. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Like, it, it, he is the perfect fit. He's the perfect fit for so many teams in the Premier League. That's why he's so in demand. But He is that player that can progress the ball through. He is, a yeah. pass, a dribble, he can score a goal, he can... There is, there is like no, no better prospect in world football for me at that job than him. So why wouldn't I bring him up? And then just your last one before we move away from my last one. Um, Well, I feel like we need someone, especially looking at it today, to sit next to our holding midfielder that we have usually. Ericsson in big games. I feel like he he has got it in him. Wouldn't that be Bellingham? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be. Um, But like I said, Casemiro was absent. Yeah. Casemiro is absent, so if we're if we're picking at straws, oh, so like an understudy to Casemiro, an understudy because he is the most important. Yeah, he is the most important for United. Um, I'd probably go for a dream scenario. I don't want to say him. I don't want to say Declan Rice. I don't want to say Declan Rice. <laughs> Pro, proper Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Rise. Yeah, hey, it's it's in not, England. We've always you know, had the narrative of your Brexit. I'm not Brexit. <laughs> I'm not Brexit. You can't name one foreigner. <laughs> Jack went with, right, I need to, dream scenario, I need to keep it realistic. Declan Rice is like 80 million. Jude Bellingham's like 130. Well, well, Harry Kane United, is 100 United million. United don't have a price limit. They don't, they don't have a price limit. Like, we can, we're getting new owners. We can sign anybody. Well, I thought you had a price limit the other week. Oh, with Vegost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking skinned. That's this guy's money. Yeah. We've got no money. Got no money. money. It's like, it reminds me of the situation like we see in Liverpool now, um, struggling for money. And Athletic about this nonsense article who apparently well, quoted 354 million in Fred Mbappe and he rejected it. <laughs> like FSU and yeah, that's all right. <laughs> we can't fork out 10 million. We will move on to Liverpool. Um, so we've covered the team that are sort of like at the prime point of the project mm-hmm. in Arsenal. Manchester United are the team that are on the, at the foundations of the project. Mm-hmm. Liverpool's a very interesting one. Um, <clears throat> their project sort of ran through the cycle almost and sort of everyone knew it was coming when it'd get to a point where, you know, Klopp would have to start rotating the rebuild. players. The, the, the rebuild almost. And in world football, really... Who are the managers that rebuilded, rebuilded, rebuilt a successful team? You're talking about Ferguson and arguably Wenger. Wenger to some extent. Um, just before we move on to uh, Liverpool and them rebuilding, Ferguson did it over the period of about four years. Um, the 1999 treble winners went on a massive dynasty. Uh, that was like a three, four year dynasty where they won everything and that team was, you know, there's there's players in and out, but the foundations of that team remained. And Ferguson, from 2002 through to 2007, only won one title. Mm-hmm. Um, that was in 2003, because Arsenal, the Invincibles, and Jose Mourinho's Chelsea disrupted these pro- this projects that um, Ferguson was trying to phase out of. You know, he had players like Van Nistelrooy, Sebastian Veron. Uh, they came in, they sort of, they were good players, don't get us wrong. Veron sort of flopped. Van Nistelrooy was definitely a good player, but the project didn't really start mm-hmm. until Ronaldo and Rooney started to mm-hmm. grow, mm-hmm. where Van Nistelrooy was sold and Luis Sahar came in, who's who's not the same level as Van Nistelrooy, but he's he was better for the project. Michael Carrick came in, better for the project. And now we had a team that won three in a row and the Champions League in 2008. That was his second project his second rebuilt team Mm -hmm. one manager really in the history of football has rebuilt Mm -hmm. um a team 
What do you think Klopp is doing with Liverpool and how is he rebuilding? Well, That's first of all, I don't think there's any man better for the job for Liverpool. Um, but I think what Klopp's doing now is he used a really good, he used a really good expression, uh, I think, after the Chelsea game. One, including Stefan Pesetic, that he saw an open door and he's gone straight through it. Um, and he also said uh, that he said this season is not great. It's one of the worst. It's, it's his worst under his, as a full season as Liverpool manager. But one of the expressions he used was, is one of the great things about this situation is players that wouldn't normally get the chance when we're at the top level will now. So we could really progress some of these players without spending into great footballers. But I think where we're at now is we know that, this, like you said, Ferguson, three, four years at the top. you got Wenger's best teams of three, four years at the top with the same team. We've been using pretty much the same team in Liverpool for coming on nearly six years. No one really does that. And then a team that's been going like that for six years just plays like 60 games the season before, every single game possible. It's like there was an article that was produced that said about how there was a feeling after the final uh, against Madrid that we knew this team was coming to an end. So, thankfully, I think that the situation, in my opinion, isn't as bad as it seems. If you look at the grand scheme of things, I think the big problem area is 100% midfield. It's 100%. It's all on midfield, really, because we've still got the spine of our team everywhere but there. And what I mean by that is, is like, Van Dijk's getting a lot of hate, like, big criticism at the moment. But I think that people do realise that no defender ever defends on his own. He always had that solid midfield, who had that base, I mean... Van Dijk was never really in danger when it came to it and sniff it out, but now he's in danger all the time. Yeah, He's got nothing to stop him. Mm-hmm. So he's like, this high line that we play, if there's nothing in front to stop it, you're constantly under pressure. So I think that he's, the defence, in my opinion, the goalkeeper, surprisingly, is fine. And the attack, I think we're absolutely flooded with talent for years to come. The problem is midfield, and where that rebuild will start, and as we know it will, is with midfield. Right. So... Luke said that there is a foundation, there is a nucleus to this structure that will hold Liverpool will hold on to with Klopp whilst they phase into the next phase. Mm-hmm. Um, who is that for you as not a Liverpool fan? What is the nucleus that you see remaining to be the next skeleton for Klopp to build off in his next team? I think Alisson to begin with is immovable. Trent, um, Van Dyke, Canate, Canate is is set, but I mean Matip's Matip's. Normal. He'll be able to one to leave within the next two. Yeah, years. Yeah, Matip will leave. I think. I think Thiago stays. I think. Yeah. I do. I think so. Too. I do. I and I think Fabinho looks as if he's, he's dropped off. Yeah, but I mean the guys, the guys are a good a good player. Yeah, he could easily get back to that level. Um, if he doesn't, he'll fizzle out. I think I do think they need a couple of midfielders. Yeah, at best. Um, and Darwin then, Nunes. They've got a lot of good. Luis Diaz, Gakpo, Jota. Jota. Everyone Jota. forgets about Jota. Like he's been phenomenal for us. And I think so. I think Salah is, is a, a tricky one. He's not part of this next team. Is a tricky one. Before I do ask that question, we've got. A spine, we've got a foundation. Like you said, this situation isn't as bad as it seems. Mm-hmm. So, Luke, I want to say, first of all, what's the Salah situation? Obviously, he's got a new contract. I think that's finalised. Yep. Yeah, Highest that's... paid player in the Prem, I believe. No, no, no. He's, he's just edging top five. Just, edgy, just edging top five. Um, so, first of all, what do you think with the Salah situation? Was that the right thing to do with the new team? And then on top of that... Um, What's the next steps? Who's the next signings to sort of rejuvenate the project Klopp's got? And right. what time period is this being done at? Right. So I think that this will be a steady climb over the next two to three years. Yeah. Um, so the Salah situation, first of all, it was not wrong to give him a new contract at all. He's arguably, well, arguably, if you go numbers wise, he's Liverpool's best player in the Premier League era, numbers wise. And he's arguably up there with Gerrard. Now, I think... Salah gets a lot of unfair criticism this season because let's face it, Salah, if he was in this Liverpool, t- if he was in a little bit different Liverpool team that had, didn't have an unbelievable system, he wouldn't have scored as many goals. He's, he wasn't Lionel Messi. He was unbelievable and he scored so many goals, but he was always like the the final man in the piece of a play. He'd come to Salah, who'd score the goal. This play isn't working right now. It's discombobulated. It's, it's, it's dysfunctional. So he's having to take a lot of onus on himself. You see him in a lot deeper positions now. 
he's still got great numbers this season. I think he's still got like 23 or 24 goals and assists this season, which, and he's, there's a lot more creative aspect to the way Salah plays now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think it was the right decision for Salah because at the same time, when you're phasing a new attack completely to keep the one that's been the best performer out of them all, I think it's essential. Um, and he, it's not just like what he can do is he's still a world-class player. He's still one of the best players in the world. These players can learn off him, and it's just he's he's he's, he's unbelievable. I don't feel like, I don't feel like I have to justify why Liverpool kept Salah. Yeah, um, it's like everybody goes on about now the narrative of Mane this Mane that. Let's not forget the season before that when we were in trouble with no centre backs. Salah still had his second best ever season at Liverpool when times were really bad. Mane scored eight goals. Yeah, so it's it's so, it's one of them. But then so go on. So I was just going to say you've. The Salah situation, and you've highlighted midfield as the problem area mm -hmm. um, that sort of links into the Salah situation, why he's not mm -hmm. performing, because he's not the player at the end of these patterns of play, because there are no patterns of play yeah, yeah. because of the midfield. Exactly. I think we've all agreed on that. What is the next step for Klopp in midfield? Well, first of all, I think there's a lot of deadwood that needs to go, because Klopp made a comment, he said, I I'm loyal, but I'm not too loyal, which kind of emphasises the fact that he is thinking that a lot of these players are going to leave. Sounds like something that you'd hear off like Love Island or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really does. Uh, but he does have that connection with his players, especially players like Naby Keita, we're trying yeah. to extend deals with, who I think should be cut. Yeah. Because we should... I mean, when he's fit, he starts more games than he doesn't. Yeah. Which shows that Klopp really likes him. Yeah, but he's fit one week a year. <laughs> exactly, that's my point. <laughs> he's been at Liverpool now for like four years and not even made 100 appearances or something. It's yeah. like... So he's never fit. So you've got to cut players like that out of there. Like Chamberlain's got to go, in my opinion. I think one of them as well. It's like depending on how we perform at the end of the season, if we get an all right offer for him, Fabinho could go. Yeah. Um, but where? What's the next steps with our midfield? What's the next? Well, step? what we know we need to get is we've lost the energy in the eights. Thiago, by the way, has had a. He's having a good season. I think the stat um, in the first games after the World Cup, after the Brighton game, he'd made thirty nine tackles. I think the next best was was Fabinho or Henderson with six. That's abysmal. That's poor. So embarrassing. And Thiago was the only one who was instigating presses properly, joining in and leading it. Now, what we need is eights to do a job because I think Fabinho, you never know, like you said, could always get back to his best. And I think Stefan Bechetic is someone we should really watch out for. He's like Klopp said, he saw the open door and he's gone straight through it. But what we need is, you mentioned him for United. It's not going away this transfer talk. Bellingham. Jude Bellingham, it's there's so much surrounding this deal. Yeah. And we need him so much. But it's not just him. We need we need someone who can just do the job, say it like Gino Wijnaldum did. Like Matthias Nunes is looking almost nailed on. You sort of need every tool in like the um the Swiss knife almost in midfield. It's yeah. like you need a progressive passer, even mm -hmm. though you've got one in Thiago, I've just got these stats up. Um his progressive numbers. 6.91 progressive passes per 90. That's pretty elite. Mm -hmm. uh, 1.22 dribbles. Very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a progressive dribbler. Mm -hmm. You need like an engine. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a tough tackling player. Mm -hmm. And you need an anchor to replace Fabinho. Mm -hmm. um, Bellingham, Nunes. you got Bellingham who can do a bit of pretty much everything. Yeah. Nunes who's a progressive dribbler. Mm -hmm. You've got, we need an anchor and an engine. Say you make yeah. four midfield signings. Who's the anchor? Who's the engine? See, the anchor one I'm really not sure on because it took us so long to get a player like Fabinho again. It yeah. took us a long time. and I don't think there's many of them readily available in world football. So depending on how the rest of the season goes, call me mental, but I think Klopp in his career, obviously, let's say Mario Goethe, has done a lot with young players. Let's just see how the rest of this season goes. Because if you see Bacetic is in and around there, and Fabinho puts up okay performances. Again, I think Fabinho's performances improve a lot with better midfielders either side who can do the running for him. Because when he has to do running, we found out he ain't got the legs for it anymore. Mm. So let's just see. I don't think that's an area we should really go for. So the anchor, I'm actually going to say just trust in Bacetic. And then the learn. engines then to... The engine, obviously we said to Bellingham, Nunes. The one player I've been screaming for before he was even linked with us was Caicedo. Moises Caicedo. Moises Caicedo. Do I think we'll get him now? No. Too expensive. Too expensive. But he's one I'd absolutely love. Um, one of the, Another player that I kind of wanted, but now he's obviously gone to Bayern, is I did like the idea of us getting Conrad Leimer um, uh, from Leipzig, but obviously he's going there. His his running numbers, I don't exactly. have them right now. They were insane. Like He's, he's constantly the best for mm -hmm. sprints and, and runs. He would have been a very good engine for you guys. 
Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a tricky one that because I don't know who else I'd really say other than, than them players um, right now because you know what Liverpool are like well, especially Klopp there's one target he wants them or it's nobody so, so yes or no answer just to wrap up the Liverpool section will Klopp see out this rebuild and will they be another success successful rebuilt team yes and how long will that take within three years within three years Jack I think it oh, it's a yes and you no answer isn't it yeah I think so and you think Klopp will win either a Champions League or a Premier League again I think and go out on a high I think I think he'll get one he'll get one yeah and he'll leave on a high I do Hurts, but yeah. I have doubts. Um, only one man, you know, really managed to do this, and he's the greatest manager of all time. Klopp is definitely capable. He's definitely, but like, I, I, let's see what happens with the ownership situation. I mean, Wenger, Wenger did it as well. Oh yeah, Wenger. Wenger like he went from a team with like the likes of Will Tord, yeah. Overmars to Henri yeah. Bergkamp. I don't think. I think if we're talking Premier League, I think I think he can win one. Yeah, one one more. I think as well. One thing with Klopp as well. It's like his contract obviously runs till twenty twenty five or twenty six. I think it might be twenty six. But he did say today. Someone asked him like, "Have you got enough time to do this?" Yeah. He was asked like, "Have you got enough energy in the tank?" He said, "I've got energy for another ten years." So you never know. We could see him extending. I think that's a perfect Scary. way to finish the Liverpool section. Scary. Uh, last team that we want to talk about. Obviously, there's projects going on all around the Premier League. You know, you look at the likes of Aston Villa, for example. It's definitely loads you can talk about there. Mm-hmm. Who's another team? Fulham, they're doing all right. Brighton, mm-hmm. under Deserby. Yeah. Brentford under Thomas Frank. There's loads of potential teams. I just wanted to do one more team. It's not City, because they're... It's seamless. You don't really need to talk yeah, about it. They're masters no, no. of managing the project. Yeah. It's it's a bit of a batshit pro- crazy project I think we I know I can all, tell you it's, I can tell you, I can it's tell you fucking history, Chelsea yeah. mate yeah. like <laughs> what the fuck is going on at Chelsea yeah. oh, like I, I Bowley saw, is on no, no. summit mad like. no, no. I saw a really funny tweet the other day that really made me laugh it was like it's on the Liverpool page but Art saying no way at top Bowley can't believe it Arsenal have bidded 50 million for Naby Kaiti you better get in there <laughs> <laughs> so, that pretty much sums it up though yeah. whoever someone bids for is yeah. like times 10 yeah. Mate, I was I went I was having a conversation with um someone at work and we literally counted on the books right now, including loan signings and loan signings that aren't here. There's Zhao Felix, Unkunku, Lukaku, Havertz, Carney Chukwe 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 Yeah, that guy. <laughs> um Sterling. Um if you got any more names, Hudson Adoy. Bamiang's up front. Oh Bamiang's still there. Um, oh, we said habits. We got Pulisic. What Pulisic? We've Mate, got, this this could be like not, a. You said Nani Madueke. We've not said Nani Madueke. Nani Madueke. We've not said Nani Madueke. Mate, <laughs> Mate, like it's like you've given a fourteen-year-old a career mode on amateur, <laughs> and they just gone. I'm just sat at everyone. <laughs> the day, this this career mode is so unrealistic. I think they would have deleted it by now. Yeah, yeah, honestly, like if this was a career mode or like an FM save, and you saw this shit going on, you'd be like, this is like mm-hmm. this is a cracked yeah. save, mate. Just delete it, like. Honestly, I don't even know how to put sense to the madness, but Jay, I'm asking you, can you put sense to the madness? What is Bowley's direction? I don't think there's any point in it because it just looks like panic. Yeah. It looks like they've signed... When you sign players like Sterling, you sign players like... You've got Havertz, you've got Jao Felix on loan. This is what he inherited. Yeah, you yeah. think, job done. Yeah. Like, okay, you've got a structure, you've got a plan. Work from it. Let's work from that. Now they go and sign Noni Madueke, they go and sign... Mudrick. Yeah. yeah. And Kunku's coming in the summer. And Kunku's coming. And then Felix is there. Suddenly you've got about 14 teams. Yeah. And you're like, are we going to play them on youth, on reserve team level? Like, what are you going to do with all these players? But it just seems like if they're, if at least one of them is going to succeed, do you know, so, that seems to be the mentality. At least one of them is going to be a good player for us. So we'll get there eventually. It. It eventually, it, it depends as well. We need to see what happens in the summer because the, if he doesn't have a clear out, Graham Potter's going to be stood yeah. there in his tactical room with... Uh, is Graham Potter... Is, is he even really stood there? <laughs> I know, yeah, we always have you again, won't we? <laughs> but... Uh, I'm going to have both of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, both of them. Diego Simeone's available in the summer as well. <laughs> Just... Uh, <laughs> he stood there like a body band, don't you? And so it's fine, all pointing, dancing away, taking that on the sideline, Gary Barlow on piano. <laughs> 
<laughs> but um, no, it's absolutely mental. And if he, if he starts having a bit of a clear out, you might see more sense. Like for example, if Pulisic gets let go, there's a lot of rumours about Sterling potentially leaving. But what baffles my head is like they've still got a lot of work to do in all their areas. Yeah, like they've, like, they've the got field. the defenders they've just been buying willy nilly. Like they just bought in Badashile yeah. in Kulabali's position, really. Mm. And it's like midfield is like Kante. He's gone. He's gone. He's in gone. The yeah, he's got to go. Really, yeah. he's never fit. He's, he's on. He's leaving on a free. I think. Oh, is it really? Summer, yeah. And then you got Jorginho, who looks like he's potentially he could leave. He's leaving on a free as well. Yeah. So it's, there's a lot going on. It's like what is going to happen? So there's what makes it more mental, even though they've spent like one point one point two billion, I think, in a time we've spent of in any transfer under club. I think something ridiculous yeah. like that, or is it the last ten windows? Yeah. There's got to be more spending. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's <laughs> scary. It's just going to be anyone that's good as like they tried to buy into a family from 20 million. That, yeah, yeah. We well, were expecting a clear out somewhere, aren't you? Like in the summer, I know you yeah. talked about Kante and Jorginho, but you need to you need more than that. Right. You need more than that to leave because, like, if we're talking about a Graham Potter system, maybe they just want to actually get back to the heights urgently so they get signing all the players they can now but you see that they're they're all kids they're all like they're all like projected times they're not they're not they're they're not nailed on so I just want to say I feel like there's so much going on at Chelsea that could be its own podcast in itself Mm -hmm. I just want to say is Bowley going to crack the Premier League is he is he is he going to get it right and if so like how long is it going to take and Mm. I think he's watched too many Amazon Prime, like documentaries, documentaries and <laughs> yeah. Netflix documentaries. You think, you know what? That's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to throw yeah. loads of money and think, fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just, he's gone in there high as a kite and gone in 100 million. <laughs> Mudrick's coming over from Ukraine and he's like, bloody hell. I'll, I'm on an eight year contract. If I'm rubbish, I can just go. Can just sit here. Jack, well, can they, can they somehow formulate this into a success, successful thing? The thing is, we've talked about Arsenal and how well they've sort of picked out certain players and made them fit a system. Arteta's done that really well. He's made certain <coughs> what we would could what we would consider average players a few years ago looks elevated sudden, suddenly. I think Chelsea need to take their advice. They need to actually think the most important thing in any team is that system and making players that fit that system. If you try and pit, uh, fit like square pegs in round holes eventually it's going to come undone. By that logic, it'd make more sense for Arsenal to spend 500 million out of nowhere because they've, exactly, they they've got a plan, they've got a blueprint. Exactly, yeah. So they can say, oh, well, this guy fits there, this guy fits there. Bowley and it's like, he said, all right, well, Potter, you sort out the system. He's not even let him sort it out and yeah. then just went, oh, well, here's another... Yeah. There's a, no way as well that Potter's won't ask for all them players. Yeah. No. Not a chance. No. Because he, he's, it's a now, burden. he's got it's a, a burden. conundrum because he's got loads of injuries for a start. He's come into the job where the club wasn't doing very well. They've just lost a very, very good manager in Thomas Tuchel. Now he's like, now I've got to put my implement my system. But he's got new players every single week. And then mm-hmm. Tom Bolly's back. He probably feels inclined to play these new players too. A hundred, there's politics and defo in play when there's an owner. Exactly. That crazy. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's a poison chalice for him. Yeah. It's an absolute poison chalice because I, I struggle to see him coming out the other end. And yeah. that's the sad thing because he's a great manager. That's the, if you looked at Chelsea right now, you'd think they've been through four transfer windows. Yeah. The, amount, the amount of players they've got that just yeah. you're like where are they mm-hmm. it's like watching Man United for 10 years and going they've had they're, four they've different they've speed run Man United yeah. <laughs> they've, had, they've, had, they've had four different managers they've got players from different managers that don't really fit into one system and Ter- mm-hmm. Ten Hag's come in and he's gone I need to strip away all the bollocks mm-hmm. and think about what works in my system mm-hmm. all they've done Chelsea have done is looked at that and gone right we'll, we'll get the Man United for the last 10 years but we'll do, do it, it in one transfer window <laughs> yeah We'll do it in one. We'll get all. The, we'll, we'll pretend as if we've had four managers in one window, and it, it, it's it. It must be a headache for Graham Potter. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we've covered uh, the main projects on show. Um, if you want another episode where we cover like the more you know intricate projects, like what Newcastle and Saudi Arabia are doing, um, mm-hmm. there's interesting shit going on there. I've heard that. Ronaldo could possibly go on loan yeah. from Saudi Arabia if they qualify for the Champions League. You got Spurs, which a bit of a mess right now with Conte, Conte going at the end of the Conte season. Conte going. Um, if you want another episode on projects and how to rejuvenate a squad, how to start foundations, more on like how coaching is involved to start foundations, uh, we'll definitely go into that. Uh, this has been a bit of a Premier League focused episode as well. 
Uh, we are filming another podcast straight after this, which touches on a bit more European football as well. So uh, if you want another pod relating to the this sort of topic area, let us know. Uh, but thanks for watching. Uh, this has been me, uh, Luke and Jack. Nice one.